Now we are going to move over to ESG um, and the need for impact uh, business. So I'm going to unshare, well, stop my video and hand it over to the panelists. Hi, and I'm hoping that I can be heard. Uh, so Elizabeth, just maybe give me a thumbs up or um, great, fantastic. Hi to everybody that is joining us this uh, wonderful morning, I guess, on a Saturday. Uh, hopefully everyone has a bit of a hangover. So this is a great way to get over your hangover from Friday um, and to listen into some exciting um discussions around ESG and um, impact businesses. And so I'm wondering if all the panelists are up already. I can see one video um, on, uh, so I don't know if the others are also available and, uh, and there. But I would like to start off by introducing myself. I'm Benai Musandu, previously worked for an impact fund called Goodwill Investments, and now work for a growth private equity fund called HPE Growth Focused um, in Europe. And so it's really lovely to be had here uh, today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to an engaging conversation. So to everyone who's going to be there, please feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. So I'd like to start off by allowing the panelists to introduce themselves, but I always have a sin in how people should always introduce themselves. Um, so if we would start off, please could you state your name, um, your surname, of course, what you do, and also if you were a vegetable, which one would it be and why? Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's a spanner in the works, but it's always it's always great to, to break the ice in that way. So Colin, would you like to, to, to start off for us? that last question not really <laughs> but anyway i think uh yeah i'm colin owls i run a uh, consultancy called innovation catalyst and the idea is to work with curious and courageous leaders to help them reinvent their organizations um i also do a lot of introductions um to bring ceos and leadership teams together um whether for lead generation or for uh, just building communities so they can network and and uh all boats float typically when you go and do that uh vegetable probably a tomato because i believe they're quite healthy <laughs> if they're even a vegetable okay, so there we have it healthy tomatoes uh that's that's exciting for a response let's see prince would you like to uh, introduce yourself okay um hi everyone i i hope you can hear me Okay, great. Yeah, so my name is Prince Eduapia um, from Accra, Ghana. I run um, One Billion Africa. I'm in a social impact nonprofit space. Uh, I, I run One Billion Africa, which is a, um, a civil society movement that inspires and empowers young people to look within their communities, identify problems, and turn these problems into projects, not to point fingers and blame others to you know, um, 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 engage in problem solving when they can be leaders themselves. And uh, we do this by, by, by leading by example. And so uh, we run projects um, in the areas of the first five sustainable development goals. We engage in advocacy to get, you know, a lot more um, youth, especially of Africa, to find problems within their communities and to turn them into projects. Uh, we also provide various support services for youth change makers that are you know, turning problems into, into projects. On the vegetable question, um, well, I'll just say carrots because I, I love the color orange. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I guess it's fair for people to love the colors that they like. <laughs> so carrot it is. I might call you by your vegetables by the end of this, this, this session. Um, Rizan, Rishan, I hope I'm saying that correctly. And if it's incorrect, please correct me. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourself. And I think you have this the common problem of being on mute and speaking at the same time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rishan. I'm from KwaZulu Natal. I currently work as a research associate at the University of KwaZulu Natal. I've attended uh, the BYM Summit on two occasions, in 2014 and 2015. 
I became an alumni of uh, alumnus of uh, BYM in 2014. I'm on the executive committee of uh, the Golden Key International Honor Society, and uh, I've studied um, uh, finance and uh, uh, business through uh, Mancosa in in Durban. Thank you. And uh, if it, if I had to be uh, choose a vegetable, I think I'll choose a potato because uh, I'm very relaxed, but at the same time, I'm quite disciplined at what I do. Thank you. <laughs> disciplined potatoes. Okay, <laughs> Joshua. Um, hey, Dinai, can you hear me? Awesome. Um, hi, I'm Joshua. Uh, I'm from Nigeria. I run a nonprofit organization called Learn Blue, which is led by young people, Generation Z individuals. Um, we organize massive social media campaigns to create awareness on issues that we feel like a threat to our future, you know, climate change, um, pollution, and of course, inequalities. Um, if I were to choose a vegetable, well, that's tough. <laughs> I'm not sure garlic is a vegetable, and I know it's a, a pretty weird choice, but I would say garlic. That's a very far off choice. It's the strangest one I've ever heard from any panels I've hosted. So. I hope you have no dates after eating garlic. <laughs> That's not recommended by anybody, I guess. <laughs> hey, so um, today we have the topic of speaking about ESG and impact businesses. And so my first question is actually going to be, why do we feel that this is necessary? Why, why is ESG and impact business um, an important topic of dis discussion? So I'm going to uh, pose that to Prince. Um, to start off. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, thank you for the for, thank you for the question. Uh, before that, I would, I would I would say that you know it's really great to be here. Um, I was part of the cohort in twenty sixteen. Um, BYM really. Um, helped helped um, change my life, you know, in so many ways, and I I really wish you know the current cohort would 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 you know um, their stories would would be no different. To go on to answer your question, I think ESG um, and social impact um, 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 businesses are very very important because you know. Um, we are we are in an era where we, you know we're, we're talking about the sustainable development goals uh, by by the United Nations and world leaders. We are um, as well. Uh, the African Union has come up with the Agenda 2063, which is a 50-year plan that is looking at you know creating an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa that is driven by its own people and representing a, a dynamic force in the global arena. I believe there is no way we, we have a chance in achieving the, the SDGs uh, by 2030 and the Agenda 2063, by the year 2063, if, if we, we, um, we, we, we do not factor ESG and, and social impact, you know, ESG conversations around um, how organizations are working, are they um, um, giving a blind eye to climate change, um, the processes um, um, with regards to waste and pollution and, and so on and so forth, you know, the social aspects looking at uh, working conditions within various um, 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 organizations, talking about, you know, the the, the corporate as well as civil society um, um, and, and government, you know, employee relations uh, and so on and so forth. And the government, the governance aspects talking about, you know, board diversity and, and board composition and so on and so forth. These are very, very important issues that, you know, we need to, we need to look at if we're going to go anywhere, you know, to achieve the sustainable development goals, as well as realize the vision of the agenda 2063. Well, that's interesting you bring up the sustainable development goals. So I'm gonna pose a question here as a person who hails from the impact space and has lots of questions about it actually. Um, do we actually find that the SDG goals are relevant for the continent? Do they actually speak to what can actually be measured um, is it a realistic assumption to make or is it just a checkbox exercise that we're seeing happening? I'm going to pose that question to Colin. Uh, there were three questions there. 
<laughs> with context. So yeah. So I guess, I guess do they do they have relevance for Africa? I mean, they're relevant globally. I mean, you can't really look at any of the uh, SDGs and say that you can disagree with any of them. I mean, they're they're kind of you just wish that you woke up and they were just already there in place, and that's the way that we uh, you know we're actually living. Um, how how difficult? I guess the last two questions: How likely is it? Is it a tick box exercise? Yeah, for some, you know, it might be, but you know, I think deeper than that, these aren't easy goals. I mean, so let's just go through a couple of them. Um, you know, we don't want any poverty, but how, how do you do that? Um, when you think about the structure of business in, I don't know, South Africa versus Nigeria versus the United States versus, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, and the interaction between government and the business sector, and the different goals that you've actually got in those different groupings, the different beliefs that you've got in those different groupings. So it's a no brainer that we should be trying to make sure that, you know, these get adopted in hearts and minds across people across the globe. I just don't know really how likely it is that this can be done because it's obviously so complex. A bit of a negative yeah. answer, but no, no, no. And it's, 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 it's hard. Actually it's quite a realistic um, uh, 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 well, answer in, in reality. Um, and I think I, I wanna then, you know, push the question to, to Joshua, which is around measurement, right? Um, we talk about these goals, we talk about ESG, then we speak about impact measurement and, and how realistic is it for um, social enterprises to be able to be accountable? And when we talk about measurement, what do we actually mean by that? And that question um, yeah. sorry is there a delay or is it me there was a bit of a delay but i think i got it okay um no yeah you're right i mean the work that sort of we've tried to do at lemblu is to well generally really is to um educate people on the global goals right at, 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 at the forefront and also to personalize it i think for measurement, it's so hard because um, I, I, I had an interview a couple of days ago and I was asked, you know, how do you measure impact? How do you quantify what you're doing and ensuring it's actually, you know, working? And, and we cannot really do that. So what we tend to do for, measure, for measurement, at least in, in, in regards to my experiences, if you're going to have a campaign that's to um, create awareness, right? Um, it's on social media. We try to measure... Um, you know, engagement rate, how, how people are reacting to certain posts or how you are, you know, commenting or we always have a CTA call to actions, um, which, you know, people would, of course, follow. But, but I think outside of the online sphere where you have actual metrics and data that you can track, if you are a, an organization or um, a branch of a, of a corporation that deals with physical outreaches is harder. Oftentimes you can even falsify figures and when you're measuring things, you're like, oh, we've reached 2 million people or we've reached you know, um, 1,000 students. Um, how do you have that number? Or how do you have, um, how do you track the progress that I would make? And how are you sure that they actually are impacted by what you're trying to say, right? Because of course, I could talk to everybody here and everybody could leave and decide to do whatever I wanted to eventually. So how do you quantify and track those who are actually impacted and those who are actually taking what you're saying and making good use of it? I think that's that's something that um, is, is, I think, constantly being worked on. And I don't think there's like set formula for it yet. In as much as, we want to say uh, you have the UNICEF and, and mighty organizations like the UN, even they do not have accurate data in most cases, it's often approximate. You know, I, I study statistics, it's often um, rounded off, right? There isn't any accurate measurement of this is what we have done or this is what lives will have changed. It's always, oh, we've done X and Y because of this formula. And I think, yeah, it's, it's just so hard to track and there is more work that needs to be done with that, yeah. Maybe Rashan, from from your perspective, you know how how can we actually um, make it more measurable? How can we actually hold it uh, to more accountability for us to really talk about impact or ESG? I mean, to be honest, there's a difference between ESG and impact measurement. So how how can we you know really ensure that we we are being accountable to the SDG goals?
Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, in order to measure impact, uh, it's not a very easy thing to do because every country has um, some issues pertaining to resources or equipment or uh, who people want to associate with within industries and companies. So the only way is to uh, try and form uh, bridges between people in different sectors and to try and um, find ways of implementing uh, your, uh, your tasks in, uh, in a way that you can achieve something out of it. That should be the starting point. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the, the goals that have been stipulated by the United Nations, that is achievable, but uh, th those goals are mostly for people who are like in the government sectors and you know, like, uh, like high stakeholders who are able to actually achieve that. But uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, as a starting point, you have to start off um, from small by building uh, bridges between people in different companies. And from there, you can try and uh, move forward to, uh, uh, to implementing impact because uh, impact is something that, uh, I won't say it can't be measured, it can be measured, but there are different uh, criteria that different people use to measure impact. I hope that helped, is that helpful? Thank you. I mean, it's good to just have this to pick. So, I mean, I, I come from the, the, what would be the investment side, right? And we have LPs, LPs that have requirements for particular goals. And so you can put a nice little stamp there and say, I do SDG one. But when you actually really go down into the nitty gritties, um, how am I actually measuring SDG one? And if I have a portfolio with 12 companies, that do various different things, maybe in different sectors and, and different um, geographies in different ways. How do I aggregate that, that it's meaningful uh, in a way that you can state that you are um, uh, an, an impact, let's say an impact fund, or you can then state that that is an impact business. And uh, so it is, a, it is obviously a complex uh, topic of uh, discussion, but it's also good to discuss it here and what are the, the issues around there. I would like to ask uh, another question, but that's all to the panelists. I mean, where do you think that um, ESG and impact uh, is going to, to take uh, the continent? Uh, where do we think the most profound, um, uh, what can I say, the most profound effect or uh, profound impact uh, is going to be seen? Uh, where are we going to see that and, and why will that be beneficial? So I can start off with, uh, anyone can jump in to respond to it first. So feel free. Hi. I actually think it depends on the individual uh, because um, social uh, entrepreneurship, uh, sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to include ESG. It depends on the type of business that you have. But um, at the same time, ESG, it, it's usually in, in, in large businesses where, uh, the, where the aim is to achieve a profit. But at the same time, you also have to look at the people or the clients who buy purchase, uh, who purchases goods from companies because uh, every client would want to purchase something different and some people don't even, uh, they're really not interested in ESG. You, 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 know, you understand from where I'm coming. So I'm like 50-50 with it. Like in terms of where the continent is going with it, I'm like 50-50, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a good thing, but at the same time, it does have its setbacks. And don't worry if your other panelists have opinions on this as well. Please, let's keep this engaging. It doesn't need to be as formal and stiff. So jump in. So I'm not sure it's gonna, um, if I, th I think about the way that you phrased the question, the fact there are the UN and, and SDGs and there's this interest in um, impact investing. I'm not convinced that this is what's going to generate change in Africa. Uh, to me, these are the measurement systems to see what the progress is. You've got to go and, and work out if you want to go and, and, and transform countries, how to incentivize the different stakeholder groups to do the things you know that you want. So, for example, um, on a uh, uh, let's just take a, a really simple one. If you want people to stop burning coal, right, then 
you can use something like a carbon tax. That's one route to go and do it. Obviously, we can teach people about the damage that coal is doing, but South Africa and the other coal producing um, countries across Africa are not going to suddenly stop producing coal because obviously then we're going to just go and turn the lights off across the, the whole of Africa. So if you want, you, you can't go in this with the ethos that, you know, people are going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. You've got to go in with the idea, how do you incentivize them to do it? Because there will be, a, I guess, a financial gain so that you can look at it. And obviously on this particular example, that could be there's an international carbon tax that's set, or it's the fact that um, green energy sources are just coming down in cost so quickly um, that it's making it absolutely inevitable that everyone will move on to green and we want to accelerate it now. Um, or it's an education program, or it's a government-led initiative to go and create the skill sets that you need to go and scale these types of implementations. And so what I'm saying there is that the problem really is very specific. That's around carbon. You know that you've got a massive problem. You've got to do something about it, but you've got to incentivize it. You can do that without having any reference point to the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals. Right. And you've got to go through it. Each of those problems, therefore, that we're, you know, we're dealing with poverty, you know, how do you go and solve poverty? It's irrelevant um, that you can look at a global scorecard and, and see the Gini coefficient is just continuing to go completely the wrong way. You've got to go and look at it and government and say, what is how do we solve the um, this issue of poverty and bias that sits within our country so that we can see as a political party and a democracy that we're going to get, you know, re-voted back in because we know that this is a path that is just going to improve people's lives and get the voters to sort of go behind us. So I'm not sure just having the template there is necessarily impacting particularly around policy and, and what big business are doing. I think the problems are there and obvious enough that they've just got to get better at, you know, um, finding ways to go and path, uh, find correct paths to get through this um, just because it's so bloody obvious. I don't know. <laughs> Well, so you've mentioned government a lot. Do you think that that is the channel? So what, what's your opinion then on impact funds that are out there, LPs that now have to look at uh, ESG considerations, pension funds that are now being held accountable for where money is being allocated? And what's your opinion? So on I'm, that? Not, I'm not sure um, that they've really impacted yet because, you know, BlackRock come out um, and they make a bold statement saying that they're only going to start focusing on investing in companies that, you know, are dear to um you know uh good governance and good social sort of responsibility standards okay great you know two months later they're holding a massive you know road show in saudi arabia and then you know putting funds into saudi arabian companies so so people are saying it and they're doing it but it doesn't seem to be happening and and although in pockets it is it's not happening at the scale that you need it um to actually be you know occurring until you know imagine if if BlackRock went the extreme and they pulled all of their money out and they didn't give people choice and they would only invest in companies that in general were doing good or at least more good than they're doing harm. And that accelerated. And then every other investment company, you know, Fidelity did exactly the same thing. Right. And they agreed that and they were either did that because it was but, but they can't because obviously they've got their shareholders you know, sitting behind it. So it, I think progress is being made, but it feels um, glacially slow from what I'm reading. Well, I'm going to jump to the next person and make the statement that actually because the issue is that you can't measure it and is there a financial return that comes with it, right? So that is another maybe point of discussion here is that are we able to have impact where there is profit um, and where you are still growing the share of the pie while also contributing uh, to a better society? Uh, that's that's the reality of private equity moving into to, uh, the impact space. Uh, Prince, I don't know if you have uh, any thoughts as well you want to add on this uh, topic. Yes, uh, I I have some thoughts on uh, um, can we look at impact where there is there is profit. You know, um, there was this study um, that happened in, in America in the year twenty eighteen. Um, it, it was called the Porta Novelli Purpose Study. You know, they were exploring how companies can build, you know, deeper bonds with their, with their customers. And um, I, I chanced on some of the findings. Um, if, if there's time, I'd love to mention them. You know, about 78% of Americans believe that companies must do more than just make money. They must positively impact society as well. 77% felt that, you know, stronger emotion connect. Uh, they felt they felt a stronger emotional connection to purpose-driven companies over traditional companies. 
66% said they would switch from a product they typically buy to a new product for, um, from a purpose-driven company. And 68% said, look, we're more willing to even share you know, um, um, brands on, on our social media and other platforms, brands who are dri driving the purpose driven uh, agenda, who are, you, you know, have created space for ESG, who have created space for social impact. So I believe when you look at this in the, in the long term, yes, um, um, there is a conversation on if, if we are focusing on, on, on um, ESG processes and making sure we are, we are checking all the right boxes and we are making impact as well or, or, on, our, on our customers. If you look at things, uh, I mean, I mean what, if you do this, if we do this, we focus on this, are we still going to make our profit as a company? I believe when you look at it in the long run, yeah, uh, the, the answer would be would be a yes for me. I, I believe the goodwill is is more important. And like I said, with this, with this particular study in America, that is the kind of you know mind shift that is happening. Um, um, and and I mean, I'm forced to look at that within the African context. You know, there there are uh, there are, there are so many wrongs that are that are happening. I can give several examples in the, in the case of Ghana. But uh, I mean, there's a question that who, who is monitoring these things, who is making sure that companies are doing the right thing. And when we look at the adverse effects of it in the long, in, in the long run, I, I, I believe that um, um, we, 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 we're gonna be in trouble. So I am for the notion that, that yes, if companies focus on ESG, they focus on social impact in the long run, they stand to benefit the most. And just adding to that, right, because you've got lots of examples where companies are already um, benefiting. And this is right in you know, Joshua's um, sort of remit. So you think over the last decade, what um, social media pressure has enforced on companies like Nike and Adidas. So you remember the uproar that's there with the sweatshops um, in Asia for Nike, and they've had to go and, you know, um, uh, put in significant changes there, and they're not going to make that mistake again, right? But this is a very sp uh, specific user case, I think, because Nike is a brand product for retail customers. So if you're in the fashion industry and, you and you're making sort of apparel, I think that um, in that particular sector, you are going to have to be squeaky clean in terms of making sure that you're doing the right thing with your staff and the, and the wider network. Then there's other businesses more on the B2B side that don't get that type of exposure. Um, they're perhaps less inclined and less influenced, you know, by lobbying and, and uh, you know, social media in terms of what they're doing, or people are just less aware of them. Therefore, you know, everyone knows Nike. So you put a campaign out that highlights they run a sweatshop, that's going to go big really, really quickly. You know, take, um, I don't know, a small bank that's uh, sitting in uh, Zambia, right, that isn't necessarily um, doing the right practices in terms of pay across the group, or they've got significant bias in there. So, you know, it's a male dominated uh, patriarchal sort of, you know, structure, very hard to measure who's going to make a big thing about it. Are people going to go and change the behaviors in that bank? Probably not. So I think you've got some cases where certain industries and you know, certain organizations can be influenced quite quickly. And then you've got others which are gonna be incredibly slow. Can I add to that, Denai? Um, so just to add to what Collins has said and, and Prince, um, Prince mentioned sort of a long-term um, success sort of strategy, but you, before that, I think Collins was talking about every business exists to, to please their shareholder, well, pr public ones at, at the very least. And there is no, there are, there are very little public companies that would actually wanna, you know, invest in clean practices for the long-term profit. Their shareholders will be down their neck for that. Um, also, there is this whole thing about walking the talk. And I think Collins has been hitting on that um, um, since he started talking. It's, it's, we have companies that are massive. You have Nike um, as the guys who are, you know, you could call them out and they would respond. My generation does that a lot, Gen Z. Or you have Tesla, which is like the champion of like green um, energy and, and, and vehicles. And then you have those who are just somewhere there who are making pledges every year. We have the COP26 coming up um, in December and you get brands coming up to say, we're gonna, you know, practice XYZ or we're gonna 
bring out paper bags or we're going to change our stores to metal straws. Our restaurant chain is going to get better. Um, and they say that, but they don't do it. Or maybe they do for like a month or two, but as soon as the media attention is away from them or because they are not large enough or they don't get the amount of hype that they need from it because it's marketing too. Like me saying a major corporation saying they're going green is in lot is free press basically. Um, so if they don't get that, they tend to revert. And who, like um, Prince said, who monitors them to ensure they are keeping up with these standards, right? Um, you cannot march into a company and say you're not doing X or you're not doing Y. I think that's sort of why, again, my generation, we are very, um, well, like gatekeepers, if I, if, I, if I dare say, of just like monitoring at least the major brands that have an influence on how people per um, perceive ESG or sustainable development as a whole um, to ensure they are doing the right things. And if they are not, of course, that's why we call organizations like or brands like Nike out. So yeah, like who, who's going to monitor them? And also how, um, how many brands are actually walk in the talk? It's not just about saying we're going to do X or we're going to sign Y. Even Apple, um, you know, Apple <laughs> Apple launched, this was a major conversation in the climate sphere last year when they launched the iPhones without chargers in the box, claiming it's to get to their carbon um, goal by 2030. But the reality is, as, as a climate person and a statistician, when you don't sell chargers with iPhones and less than half of the owners of the previous iPhones have the right adapters, they have to buy new ones, which means more shipping and more cotton and more, you know, freight, I don't know, fuel being consumed. It's just this crazy process of like, it's all for profits in the long run. It's all just talking and not walking that talk. Yeah. Rushan, you sound like you want to say something. Uh, no, I actually support some of the views from Joshua. Uh, I think another issue is advertising, as well as uh, the type of products that you uh, that your company sells. Uh, so, um, uh, in other words, your products uh, have got to be to what um, the consumer would want to buy, so that the consumer must not be bought into this uh, false idea that the product they are buying is um, it. it, it is to uh, the client's um, standards when in actual fact it's not. Uh, another issue is the fact that governments can't come into uh, to every single aspect of ESG because in some companies, uh, yeah, ESG is left according to the company itself. So it's actually, a, it's something that's internal as well. But um, in, in larger companies, probably government can come in, but I'm not sure about that, to be very honest. You're very skeptical. Uh, Prince, you want to have to say something, but then I have to open up for some questions from the audience as well to get um, their thoughts. Uh, as they've uh, asked some questions here and Elizabeth would like me to ask some particular questions. So, Okay. Yeah, yes, I just wanted to um, um, touch on something quickly that uh, Joshua asked, uh, that, you know, who are, who are going to hold these organizations accountable? I believe in the principle of learning, you know, not copying, but learning. And, and this is one thing that we can learn from, from Europe and the West, I mean, from America and so on and so forth. Um, these are citizens, uh, we have cases where citizens are, are holding companies, big corporations accountable. I mean, in the case of Facebook, we've heard of whistleblowers. Uh, I, I've never heard of a case, well, I don't know about South Africa, but I've never heard of a case like that in, in Ghana, you know, any of the countries that um, um, I work in, you know, in, in, in Africa. So here are citizens asking questions and demanding accountability. Why? Because they have been exposed, they've been educated, they understand what greenwashing means, they understand that companies can be sneaky. Yes, here in Africa, we understand companies can be sneaky, but there isn't a lot of conversation on the topic. You hardly hear about greenwashing and ESG on radio and, and, and on TV. And so the, the normal you know, African that that um, is living their normal life doesn't really care about this. You know, they'll patronize a, a product. For example, there is this um, 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 food, food company here in Ghana, and there was a case where one of their managers actually maltreated an employee, a, a she. He actually put pepper in the eyes of this employee because she, she wasn't able to do something well. And the case was everywhere in Ghana just for a day. I, I bet you the next morning, people that heard of this case still went to the camp, I mean, the food um, um, shop to, to buy their breakfast or their lunch or their dinner. You, you, you know, what I'm trying to say is that 
there isn't a lot of conversation on the topic. And so companies go scot-free, but where uh, we, we can learn from what is happening elsewhere um, um, is when we begin to engage on the topic, we educate more people, social entrepreneurs can get involved. We, you know, media force can start conversations. Companies that are doing this well, we can start, you know, um, 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 promoting them. We can start giving them awards, recognizing them uh, one way or the other. And, and as we do this gradually, I believe that um, 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 our, our citizens are going to be well aware and begin to demand for accountability. Well, that's a, it ties well to the question that I have here as well to ask, which is around um, where does the accountability uh, begin or where does the, which stakeholders um, hold the power for that accountability? And so the question here is, does the board of directors owe a fiduciary duty to stakeholders beyond just shareholders? Um, and so who would like to take that? I can see the many non-muted people so maybe should we should we go in a bit of an order uh colin you could go first and then Rashan, joshua and prince yeah like i mean should the board of directors have a, a fiduciary you know duty um instructed on them if you can measure it i mean that would be um great to do that i'm sure there is a certain amount of that in the companies act and the uh, the role that they've got anyway just perhaps um not enough um the challenge you've got there is that most boards of directors and most executive teams are still working on the original model, which we mentioned in the in the last call, that it's a for profit and the rest looks after itself, sort of Milton Friedman type basis. And that is indoctrinated in your senior leadership team It's what you've learned at school, it's what you've learned at university, it's what you've learned at business school. And more importantly than that, it's the way that you've been indoctrinated as you've gone through your career. So changing their behaviors and their mindset is i think incredibly difficult when they are basically pre-programmed now in their 40s 50s 60s to be chasing um, profits the most important stakeholder probably is us as individuals and their customers because every product or service a business do eventually goes to an individual it's either direct or b2b to c or b2b to b2c eventually something is getting to us as an individual and clearly we've got a lot of power because as individuals, we can decide to go and march away from certain product providers whenever we want. But the trouble with that as an argument is it doesn't happen very often. The likelihood of uh, being able to go and arrange for millions of people, not just to go and stop using something for an hour or a day, but actually to change their lives fundamentally to stop doing stuff to impact what companies you know, are doing and how they're taking it more seriously, at least over the last um, few decades, even with Facebook and social media, seems to be a relatively low risk um, for organizations as we stand. So everyone here on this call could and should sell their car and just take Uber or the majority of you. Not only is it cheaper, but it will have a net benefit for um, society. We should be throwing away the plastics we shouldn't be going to uh, retailers that use plastics of any sort. We should be um, starting to go and look for places that just don't actually have it in any packaging or they have it in something that's more sustainable. You, you can put an endless list together. We should be doing composting outside with our waste if you've got even a really small yard or garden. But the, the reality is very few people are doing that. And so if we're not going to do it, then to go and expect companies and governments to go and solve that problem for us it's the it's, we need them to do it but they're also human and therefore they're not going to go and you know march on these things so i think it's a very complex um you know piece to solve this it's as much about our culture and it's our interaction as people what we believe in um and then having that kind of mindset if i just start to go and use non-plastic straws Maybe I can encourage a lot of other people and we can get a bit of momentum and it does become a thing, but it's rare. I don't see that as um, a huge risk for companies at the moment. Very interesting views uh, that you hold there. Uh, some I would disagree with, but uh, I'm not one of the panelists here today. Um, so no, I think, I think you should disagree. I'm, I'm hoping I'm wrong. No, I think I think that the context is always important. Um, 
to state that we should be doing X, Y, and Z, I think typically the burden of uh, the ills of the world have fallen too often on the poor uh, to hold that and to be accountable for it when actually they are bigger players at play that should be held more accountable. So yes, should we be conscious of what we do? But at the same time, uh, I think it's un I think it is unfair to assume that the poorest of the poor need to hold uh, the burden of that. And typically, most of the time, that is the case. So you're talking about compost yes. garden. So the that's not what I said. That's, so that's not exactly what I said. I didn't say um, it's their burden, as in they should be the solution. I just said, as a matter, you know, if you look at factually. 7 billion people on the planet, if we were all as individuals to start switching, all right, this would have the biggest impact. Perhaps I didn't explain it particularly well. What I then said is that we cannot expect us to do that because we know if we look back in terms of human nature, we just know we won't. So the solution has got to be coming from government, from big business in those incredibly powerful networks, the top 100 leaders across the globe to try and drive the solutions through. Because although we, we wish that as you know, a set of people, we could actually go and, and get our act together as a community to go and change company behavior, the likelihood is from history that we've never been particularly good at doing that, apart from a few very specific examples. Okay, heard. I think Rishan, you had an opinion, and Joshua, I can see you off mute. Joshua can go first. Rishan, are you going? Or should I? No, you can go first. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, I am, I am sorry that I, I am so, so, so we call in on this. I mean, it's literally the entire premise of um, my organization to me, my entire work, I guess, for the past four years, it's been how, I, we say change begins with us. We say it begins with you. That's the, that's the um, tagline for my nonprofit. And, and it's because that's, that's the truth, right? Um, it is a very complex, somebody used the perfect term, it's a complex habit formation sort of process. Humans do not like change, even though it's constant. We love what we're used to. It's, it's a behavior. Um, if you're used to WhatsApp, you don't want to move to Signal or Telegram because WhatsApp is bad. If you're used to drinking water from a plastic bottle, you don't want to suddenly start drinking it from a, from a um, I don't know, stainless bottle because plastic is bad. Um, so it's these practices that has been there since time immemorial, really. It's been, it's practices or, or, or little bits of um, characters that are imbued in us from, from bed. You know, primary school, secondary school, um, university, especially in Africa, they didn't teach me in, in high school to be necessarily environmental conscious, because even if they did, right, up, right, right during lunchtime, we were back to literally in our environment or something even worse. When we got back home, we revert into like a different person. Um, so yeah, just like Colin, Colin said, it's, 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 it is the government's duty that's why we that's why we um, elected them to be part of um this change to be part of ensuring that um the same development goals are, are taught and are understood and and esg is more proliferated however we are the government like i said we, we we voted them i could be elected into government someday or i could run a corporate organization or i could run an i could i could be any of these individuals who are sort of holding accountable so why not start now while i am quote unquote nobody and begin making change and habits that increase my carbon foot or reduce sorry my carbon footprint why don't i decide oh i'm gonna stop taking plastic plastic water and i did do that over the past three years and i've held on to it why and, and i think that that's what we we do again at lemblu we that's why i mean that's why i mentioned not being able to measure the impact we're making because all we really do is we try to personalize things like um, um esg environment climate change air pollution i i for one i started this whole um part of my life because i have an allergy to air pollution and i know it's a weird thing to say but i'm allergic to dust and smoke and all of that um so if i want somebody to care at all to give a damn permit me about you know the environment right or social governance i'm not going to come tell you you know um the united nations says and um, by 2030 the world is going to burn or or by 2050 it's going to be so hot those are facts and they are statistically accurate or scientifically accurate but the average human doesn't want to hear that what they want to hear is why they should care and i think one way to do that is to um talk into the humanity in them that sounds far-fetched but i mean 
you know, telling a story, um, I, I, why I do this is because I am scared for my health, my personal life. If I had an allergic reaction when I'm walking on the road because there is too much pollution in my city, I could die. And people do die from these issues. Um, so you should change that because what if your family member who has asthma had a reaction on the road and nothing could be done? What if the single plastic waste you decided not to dispose properly could have, you know, stopped a flood from happening? Or what if if you decided not to burn something in open air, you could have saved someone? So those are those are questions that you need to pose to people. And then when individuals like like Colin said, seven billion people come together and are changing their habits little by little, the government doesn't make up one percent of what that, that that exists or corporates do not make up one percent. And there will be so much impact and so much change made. All right, I feel Rishan wants to say something. <laughs> Thanks. I, th- I think it also depends on what 1% is holding majority of the money in the world and what products are being made that consumers are still consuming. That's my perspective. But Rishan, please go ahead. I think more work needs to be done on, I think, I think more work needs to be done on training uh, clients and companies about ESG because as much as it's something that it's known, uh, it's often neglected even in big companies. Um, also, there's this issue about uh, one needs to develop uh, models for management within companies, as well as uh, Africa needs to manage the resources more adequately so that uh, ESG can be uh, seen as something uh, great for the future. And uh, also the economic fundamentals. I think uh, one of the questions that were raised were on the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. I think that's, uh, that board has to do with more, it's like something like an auditing firm where they will measure uh, the ESG performance of a company. Uh, and uh, the problem with, with that is the fact that because ESG can also be something that's internalized, like what I've mentioned uh, previously, that uh, one can actually uh, alter uh, the stats of a company, for example. So uh, th- there's no transparency in that as well, or there's very little transparency. It depends on who you are within the company. So human values are also very important uh, when it comes down to ESG and the implementation of ESG in companies. I have some questions here and there isn't much time left. Um, There's a question here coming from the audience. What role can entrepreneurs play, perhaps using social media and networks to hold big corporates accountable? Maybe Prince, you want to take that? Seeing we haven't heard from you. Right, right, right. Look, uh, entrepreneurs are already playing a key role in, in various uh, areas. I, 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 let me touch on one example. There is a company in Ghana called M Pedigree. M Pedigree makes sure that there is, there is little or no counterfeit you know, product in the market. How do they do this? They leverage on technology. So, for example, if you buy a drug from the pharmacy, you can go to the M Pedigree platform. Um, there, there is a, 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 some code on that drug that you enter into the M-Pedigree platform. They're able to tell you this is a fake product or this is an original product. And they are using, I mean, this, they, they're already in 10 countries uh, plus and, and their impact is, is real time. It's amazing. So just imagine an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs get up and say, look, um, um, ESG and social, I mean, ESG is not a big thing here in Africa because people don't know a lot about it. How did um, um, the United Nations and, and, and those people that are, you know, pushing the sustainable development goals, how did they do it? Today, so many people know about sustainable development goals, the 17 goals, and at least people have heard about it. How did they do this? strong advocacy. So if a social entrepreneur goes like, you know what, we can create a platform that that, that advocates ESG and um, how the, the average you know, African citizen can, can hold organizations accountable, that is a huge step. I believe everyone has their role to play, but entrepreneurs, I mean, include come up with innovative solutions. They can approach companies and tell them, look, uh, what is the state of ESG in your company? If, if you wish to focus on the S part, you can, you can, you can partner with so and so for, for us to make that happen. You know, there, there are so many ideas in my head, but for the sake of time, to sum it up, I believe one way is that entrepreneurs can come up with innovative solutions to promote the, the, the topic on the continent.
I'm taking another question here. What um, role does the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board play in measuring ESG? And I'm not sure what I'm seeing here, but Elizabeth, you'd like to answer this question? No, you can direct at the panel. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, who would like to take that? Uh, maybe Rashan, would you like to take that or Colin? Not for me. <laughs> Not for you, Rishan. Uh, I think it has to do with measuring the ESG performance of the company. So it's like a kind of an auditing firm where they would assess your your they will they will actually look at your finances and assess your risk factors, how much uh, investors invested, how much of money goes out, whether it's uh, whether the stuff that you're selling is uh, user compliant, whether it's ESG compliant, it has to do with uh, several factors that go into play. So that's all, that's all I can say because it's quite a lengthy conversation to go into the entire thing about that board. Well, I like this next question here. How do you balance between quality and quantity when it comes to measuring ESG and impact? Hmm. Can I go for this one? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I know we have quite a little time left, so I'm just going to quite try to speed it up. But um, so, as an African um, nonprofit founder, there is a there is a there is a sort of I would call it a divide. Um, I got this from a white person telling an American, precisely. Sorry, um, asking you know why is there such a discrepancy or divide between like the global north and global south of of chain makers or SDG advocates. Um, and, and so what, what that leads to because of this divide is there is a there is an influx of people starting projects that are supposed to be talking about ESG and DSDGs, um, but it's often just like quantity over quality. Um, you get people who quote unquote, you know, impact one million people. And then you have people who impact just a thousand. Um, oftentimes, if you're applying for whatever, on applications, a million looks better. Um, and so I think it's gotten harder and harder to sort of curb, um, 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 you know, or measure quantity over, um, um, quality over quantity. But I think one of the, one of the things that, that I've seen to work is one of the ways to, 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 to differentiate between both of them is um, companies or, or, or projects that are, uh, quantity focus tend to fold up quite fast. And what that means is, you know, I've, I've had people that I know personally who start projects with their focus on the girl child or something environment, um, and, and they get the quantities and they're fine. And after a year or two, it goes out. So oftentimes the measurement of the impact of quality projects that talk about the global goals, sustainable development goals and ESGs, are often those that are long-term. I think what I even, what I look at for most times, I wanna work with, um, um, people in the SDG spaces often how long they've existed. And even sort of above two years, because that's sort of like the breaking point where people who are, who are, who are serving quality uh, lose interest in what you're trying to build. And I think just like round that off, I would say also, this is not for the question, but related to, um, I think Prince's point earlier, uh, which had to do with like accountability, I think. We, we are a generation, my generation at the very side, generation of digital natives were very savvy. I think we tend to overlook the impact that social media can have when it comes to ESG and the global goals and in, um, um, you know, educating people about them. Uh, we, we've, we've run campaigns. We've, you, can, you can basically target using Facebook and the likes of them, target to this specific um, place a person lives in to ensure they hear about something. I know millions of Nigerians quite literally live on Facebook. Local it is where you don't think they have power or electricity. They have Facebook on their phones. So if you want to create awareness or you want to talk about this or you want to educate them on like consumer rights, or you want to talk to them about pollution or why they, why they should hold their banks accountable for their CSR and ESG, you can use social media to do that, right? Um, but yeah, I think I think just back to the question you asked, um, Denai, measuring or differentiating between quality and quantity when it comes to the global goals and, and sustainable development often has to do more with like, um, one, what kind of story the brand or the, or the person or the company is telling as to why they are in ESG. There has to be a good why and how long they've been doing that for. Um, I hope that answers the question. 
we'll have to hope that uh, the person who posed the question in the audience feels like it has been answered. We are coming towards the end and there's two minutes and I'd like to leave those two minutes for some last final thoughts for the panelists that we had. So first of all, I'd like um, to thank all the attendees uh, that have been here. Uh, and to the panelists, please, if you have a moment uh, in the Q&A, there have been some questions that have been asked to you directly. So if you could also respond to them, but now I see there are no open questions anymore. So maybe we can forget about that. Um, uh, yes, I wanted to just uh, go around uh, with each of, of you. Um, and the question that I have is, uh, what are you choosing today? to contribute to the ESG and impact. And please make your responses super brief. Um, and uh, on that note, I'd like to say thank you uh, for allowing me to host. And I'll allow Prince to start and then Colin, Rashan, and then Joshua. I, I kind of miss that. Do you mind uh, mentioning the question again, please? What are you choosing to do to contribute to the impact and ESG? What are you going to choose to do? Well, to, to tell you the truth, um, I feel uh, with, with our organization, One Billion Africa, we, we are already in approaching organizations on their CSR, looking at how we can partner them, you know, to run meaningful projects. I believe uh, one of the things that, I mean, learning from this discussion, one of the things that we can begin to do is not just to have conversations on CSR with, with businesses here in Ghana, but as well ESG. I, I believe we can bring that on the, on the table because there's a huge difference between CSR and, and ESG. ESG is more deeper um, um, and, and can realize more impact on the, on the longer term. So that is one thing that I believe um, I, I can contribute. Well, thank you, Prince, for that response. Colin? Uh, well, I'm just going to contribute directly now. I think all the people on this call um, have got a massive opportunity to use the themes of SDG and um, common sense, really, in terms of the problems that need to be solved. You know, young, curious, courageous, passionate, purposeful. As we said in the last hour uh, previously, capital is available for great ideas. And so for me, trying to teach old dogs new tricks is a complete waste of time. It's the new generation developing new businesses that solve fundamental problems. I put one link in like Plastic Bank, which solves a plastic issue in a very clever way. And they're generating a bucket load of cash in terms of profits. They, these issues are creating massive opportunities. Um, and I think you're in exactly the right forum and, and grouping of people to actually discuss and, and help build each other in your networks to go and, and make money out of solving these issues. Thank you, Colin. Rishan. Hi, I think the only, uh, for me, um, it's uh, to build trust between people and to try and educate uh, the young people about ESG. That was so brief and to the point. Thank you. <laughs> Joshua. Yeah. Um... I'm going to try to be very brief, but like Colin said, really, you can't sort of teach old dogs new tricks. So um, just focus on the new generation um, and what we can do uh, or what you can do individually to, to better your, your community, I suppose. And of course, join companies that are doing amazing work already um, and, and just by that, you can make impact. Thank you for that. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you so much for giving us uh, your time this uh, morning slash afternoon. Depends where you are in the world. Um, and I think I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, just really special thanks to our host who had to step in last minute, um, but did such a phenomenal job 